Hey guys, Kevin Bupp here, and you're listening to the Passive Investor Show. Before we continue with the show, I want to provide the PI listeners with an opportunity. Like me, you probably invested in the stock market and found out that you could do better with real estate. You probably have invested in real estate yourself and found out that you created another job. You're already busy making a living to provide for you and your family. You don't need another job managing tenants and organizing repairs. What if there was another way? What if there was a way for you to benefit from real estate without having the burden to be the landlord? At the Fortes Company, we partner with investors like you and provide opportunities that are specific to your investment criteria. We operate the investment and you enjoy the benefits of passive income and everything that comes along with real estate. You deserve to keep your spare time and continue to make memories with your family. Go to www.investwithfortes.com and see how easy it is to become a passive investor today. Are you a busy professional looking to diversify your portfolio? Ever wanted to passively invest in real estate but don't know where to start? John Fortes provides you with a guide to passively invest in real estate. This is the Passive Investor Show. And now, the Passive Investor Show. Here's your host, John Fortes. Welcome, PI listeners, to the Passive Investor Show. I'm John Fortes. Our goal and purpose of this show is to be a resource to passive investors and help them master their investments in real estate funds. I'm excited to bring on Kevin Bupp. Kevin Bupp is the founder and CEO of Sunrise Capital Investors, which invests in mobile home parks, parking lots, apartments, offices, and single family homes across the U.S., He has 16 years of experience in educating investors to locate, acquire, and create higher than average returns from the widely understood niche of mobile home park investing. He shares his expertise through the Mobile Home Academy and as the host of the Real Estate Investing for Cashflow show, which has become one of the hottest real estate podcasts on iTunes. And before we kick it off, please go and review and rate his show. Please do that. All podcasters love that, and it helps us get better guests. Appreciate that. Kevin, thanks for coming on. John, thanks for having me. Looking forward to it. Awesome. Awesome. Tell us a little bit about your background and how you got started. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to keep it short and sweet. Um, so I, I was uh, introduced to real estate. Uh, it kind of, kind of came, I like to say that it found me. I didn't find it uh, at the age of 19, and um, I was in community college, not really knowing what I wanted to do with my life. And uh, uh, it was brought to me by a gentleman that was about 25 years older than I. Uh, he was a local guy to me. And uh, he uh, essentially was a real estate investor. He owned single family and small multifamily properties and lived a pretty cool lifestyle, a very different lifestyle than what I did growing up. Um, you know, I was a blue collar family, didn't go without, but, you know, ultimately didn't have a ton either. Went one family vacation a year. Never, again, it's all relative because it was, that, that's what I knew, right? It was, it was great. I had a great childhood. But he lived a very different, uh, you know, seemingly flexible lifestyle, um, one that didn't require him to go nine to five into a, you know, an office like my parents did and drove a really nice car, dressed nice, went on a lot of vacations, what have you. So anyway, he was a local real estate investor and he, uh, I befriended him and he ultimately, uh, during that initial stage of that friendship, he introduced me to what he did. Um, I had a great interest in it because it, w- it seemed as though something I could get excited about and something I could wrap my arms around, but also something that would enable me to live a very different lifestyle than that of what I was taught growing up. Again, nothing wrong with my parents, you know, choice or their decisions as they, you know, just worked, uh, you know, nine to five making ends meet. But I, I just, I didn't want that. And um, I'd always tried to make my own way from an early age. I, you know, started working at the age of 12, got a paper out as soon as I was old enough to get one, creating my own way, you know, like actually creating my own income so I could go buy, you know, back then it was like buying a bicycle or buying a dirt bike or something like that. Buying what I, you know, you know with my own money, what the things I wanted you know, not relying on my parents to do that for me. So I was always kind of self-sufficient in that manner. And so I, you know, introducing, you know, me to that, that business at the age of 19, I essentially uh, became a, a mentee, I guess, of, of, of David's and, and helped him in his business um, for about a, about a year, literally in between classes and tending bar. 
Um, I would meet him at his home office, go out in the field, do whatever he needed me to do. I mean, you can call me the, I was an intern, you know, non-paid admin assistant. I was a little bit of everything. And, um, and I just wanted to be around him so I could learn what it was he did. And ultimately it took me about a year to take the leap of faith and, you know, take my hard earned bartending money and uh, purchase my first really rundown dumpy property and uh, try to follow that same path that David had taken and had proven to be very successful for him. And so that was the start of it. Age 20 is when I bought my first property and uh, just really continued on from that point moving forward. Um, in my early 20s, I kind of hit a really good stride, you know, learning the business and, and understanding how to you know, scale the business. And uh, you know, by the age of uh, essentially 28, had a, a built a portfolio of about 130 single family properties, about 500 multifamily doors and some other miscellaneous commercial real estate. And um, uh, that, that was kind of the beginning stages. And then I call it phase one. Phase two is, you know, uh, uh, phase one goes into the crash of 2008. I lost pretty much everything. My entirety of my business w went kaput in a matter of, uh, you know, eight, eight months. And um, uh, I started a few other businesses uh, outside of real estate during that time. I really I took a couple year hiatus. I, it was a very challenging point in my life. And um, I didn't want to think about real estate, uh, which is, the opposite approach is, is what we're kind of taking today. You know, when, when the blood's in the street, you want to be out there, you know, you know, seeking the opportunities. It's a little bit harder to do when it's your own blood, right? So, um, uh, you know, I, I looked the opposite direction, started a few other businesses that were really in line with some, some personal values I had related to health and fitness. And um, ultimately got back into real estate at, you know, in, in 2011 era, bought my first property in 2012, my first second phase property in 2012. And that happened to be a mobile home park. And uh, uh, it was the first time I'd ever owned that type of asset. It was very new to me. I wasn't new to value add or, you know, heavy lift projects whatsoever. Wasn't scared of that side of it. I was scared, however, that I used pretty much every ounce of money I had because I had pretty much lost everything. I was just scraping together you know, just to get by. And I used every ounce of money I had along with a partner. Uh, and we bought that property and worked our butts off for about eight months to turn it around. And um, that proved to be very successful. And, and I liked the business. It was very profitable. And I went out and bought the next one, bought the next one, started ramping it up and um, really used our own money and our own relationships, immediate relationships to, to do the first couple of deals and kind of prove that concept. And then formed what is now known as Sunrise Capital Investors. I guess it's going on four, four and a half years now. Uh, formed that company as a way for us to essentially scale our business in a much larger manner. And also, you know, you know, share kind of the love with a lot of other investors that had an interest in what we were doing, but yet didn't have an interest in being an active investor, right? They didn't want to be the one out there sweating in the, uh, the field, out in the mobile home park trenches, uh, doing the deals. They just want to ultimately come along for the ride and, and, and share in the, you know, the profits. And so that's where Sunrise Capital Investors have, has come from. And uh, that's essentially what we do today. So we, we buy mobile home parks throughout the, you know, uh, basically uh, the continental U.S. And with the exception of a few uh, not so friendly uh, landlord states uh, and uh, ultimately buy things alongside limited partners and uh, sharing the, the proceeds and the profits uh, uh, for the future years. So that that's the long and short. I try to condense as much as possible. So no, I love it. I love it. <laughs> that that kind of brings me to exactly where I wanted to, to go with you is uh, when did you start working with passive investors and how did that come about? Yeah. So that, that's a great question. So we, um, uh, as, as I'd mentioned, you know, when I kind of jump back into the space, I'm a, I'm a huge proponent of proving your concept, whatever it is, uh, and taking the risk yourself before you bring others into the fray. And, um, and I'm not saying that it's wrong to do it the other way. However, um, I don't think that you're being fiduciary, uh, fiduciary responsible uh, if you actually go out and you haven't proven the concept. You've got a good pitch, right? Everyone, anyone could be a good marketer. Anyone can put together a good pitch deck and have a great idea, but execution is a completely different thing. And so um, I'm a firm believer in actually going and, and, and proving that concept with your own money, your own capital, risking what you have, putting what you have on the line before you go raise capital from others. And so that's, again, that's what we did. Uh, we've been, you know, well, the quite original question was, you know, uh, what was the reason behind actually, you know, bringing partners in? And so at some point you run out of your own money, right? You run out of the own, your own immediate relationships. And so that first deal we did, that was literally, I had one other partner, uh, an active partner that I brought in. I'd owned a lot of other real estate with in the past. Him and I literally put our own money, the little bit of money we had, because he had got his butt kicked in 2008 as well. And so we took the little bit of money we did, did have, and we bought that property, and we used it for um, the improvements, what have you, you know, refinance, got that money back. 
and then you know, used our money again to purchase the next park, purchase the next park. And we bought five in total with our own capital uh, or with our own immediate you know, relationships, families, what have you. Uh, but then hit a wall, right? Hit a wall to where, you know, we were really good at, we're still really good. Like one of our core competencies is finding off market deals, uh, generating lead flow. Uh, and, and so the, the leads weren't the issue, you know, the deals weren't the issue. It was the money. We hit a brick wall and we, we didn't have the, the means or the resources to continue deal, doing deals ourselves. And if, we probably could have just done like one deal a year, you know, and that, and, and there's not, again, nothing wrong with that, but we had, you know, kind of grander visions and wanted to take advantage of the opportunities that were at hand and, and buy as many as possible. And, um, you know, they're not making mobile home parks anymore. That's one of the unique uh, facets of this business is there's a huge barrier to entry in that there's not new product coming online. So we, we felt there was a, a runway of opportunity to where at some point, this niche is going to be fully consolidated. And that's already been happening. The last five years, this niche has drastically changed in, in, the, in the terms of uh, professional and institutional investors in this space, consolidating space, kind of the same thing that happened with uh, self-storage uh, over the past you know, two decades. Self-storage used to be solely mom and pop you know, back in the, the 70s. Nowadays, it's still, it's got the mom and pop element, but you know, very large publicly traded companies, institutional investors that are in that space that have done a great job of consolidating that industry. The same thing is occurring right now in, in mobile home parks. That's awesome. So how did you come across your passive investors when you started yeah. practicing that model? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, some of the first investors we came across were just folks that, um, that, that we ran across on forums, going to, you know, going to like uh, industry events, what have you. And just, you know, we were always very vocal about what it is we were doing. If we did something that didn't work, we were vocal about it. We wanted to, you know, share that experience with others. If we did something that did work, we also wanted to share that experience. So we shared those experience of, uh, experiences in, in, in the different, you know, entry forums that are out there, you know, Facebook pages, um, uh, you know, get industry networking events. But in addition to that, I, you know, I, I host two podcasts. One of them is called the Real Estate Investing for Cashflow podcast. I started that show over six years ago. And so it was, you know, shortly after us kind of launching, a couple years after us launching, you know, buying our very first park. And so I also shared the experiences on that show. And uh, I, I would go through case studies. If we were in the middle of a deal, I'd go through the case study of how we found it, um, you know, how we're going to turn it around, uh, you know, what we project the future to look like for that community and, uh, you know, what, the, you know, just the execution of that business plan and what it looked like. And so throughout all that, uh, you know, the vocal nature of sharing our experiences, podcasts, events, forums, what have you, folks, you know, inherently reached out, you know, saying, Hey, I, I like what you're doing. Um, you know, either I have an interest in learning what, what is you're doing, uh, in a much more active manner, like what you guys are doing, you know, like exactly what you're doing. Or they'll say, you know, I've got a great deal of capital. I own this business, that business, or I own other types of real estate. I like the mobile home park industry. I like the fundamentals behind that asset class. However, I don't have an interest in doing it myself, right? I'd rather put my capital with a proven operator. And I've been following what you're doing. And it seems like uh, you, you guys got it down. And I'd love to invest with you. So a lot of the investors that we have, uh, that, we've, that we've come across over the years, have been really a result of us putting it out there putting our business out there and then them seeing what it is we're doing, being able to kind of monitor our progress and then them reaching out with an interest in, you know, teaming up with us in a passive manner. That's awesome. So one of the, one of the things that I, I bring on operators and ask, and I love this question is what do you do that you specialize in that basically brings the trust of the LPs into your business? So what do you do better yeah. that separates yourself? Yeah, I think we're, we're just incredibly transparent, which I hope everyone is, right? Everyone should have 100% transparency. And so that means not just when things are going good, uh, but also when things are going bad and we have challenges, right? Because there's, there's not a business on earth that doesn't face uh, an equal amount of challenges, probably many more challenges than that of, you know, victories, what have you, right? And so we're just, we're very, we keep our investors very much in the loop. One of the unique things I think we do that Maybe others do it now, but I'm pretty sure we were probably one of the first that, that actually offered this. So we have an investor portal, a secure investor portal where they can kind of log in and get their K-1s and get their quarterly reports and you know any type of communication that we might have with them. But one of the things that we started about two years ago is on a monthly basis, actually this morning, uh, we recorded our, uh, our, our May update for our investors, but we typically, uh, at the middle of the month, any given month, we'll record what we call as a private podcast. And it's essentially myself and, and our team. Uh, we have kind of different departments where we give updates on and we'll go through and give an update on 
each one of the funds uh, respective to uh, that investor base. So they can truly get a sense of exactly where we are, you know, construction projects, um, uh, you know, if, if we're, you know, disposing of an asset or uh, if we're in the middle of a, of, tur- of a turnaround project. So we go into detail on a monthly basis uh, with them. And so it allows them to, again, not just not just only wait for the quarterly report to come out and read it, but also everyone responds to different type of, uh, um, uh, of learning, right? And so some people prefer to read, some people prefer to listen. I'm a listener more than I am a reader. And so uh, it gives everyone a different taste of, uh, of, of who we are and what we're doing. And they can kind of selectively choose which type of update they prefer. And uh, again, the month to month is much more in depth than you know, the, the quarterlies would have. And so Again, I think it makes us unique. It, it adds a, an additional layer of um, transparency to the business, and uh, we've gotten phenomenal feedback uh, for, you know, from that. So, and then one of the other things I think that makes us, um, you know, incredibly unique is uh, we go through a—I don't want to call it a vetting, uh, a vetting process—and but it's we want to make sure that both we're aligned with our investors and our investors are aligned with us. You know, and. Um, there's been a lot of times where we've turned away investors, right? Or, you know, it just, they have the money, they want to put it with us. And it's just not, we don't feel like it's a good fit person, you know, personality wise. And, um, or maybe it's long-term investment philosophy, right? There could be many different reasons why it might not be a good fit. And so um, my business partner, Brian Spear, he's our, uh, you know, head of investor relations. So he's always kind of the first point of contact. However, um, I typically get on the phone with every single potential investor before, we, you know, before either we or they decide to move forward. And so I want to ensure that both Brian and myself have had a very lengthy conversation with the individual to ensure that, again, that our, our core interests are directly aligned. Because this, is, this isn't a, this isn't a um, uh, just an investment. You know, this, this, is a, this is a marriage. I mean, it's, it's a partnership. It's a marriage. There's no getting away from each other, right? I mean, once you're together, until those assets are disposed of, you're in it for the long term, you know. And uh, that long term can be the year, can mean ten years, can be mean even longer than that. And so, I want to ensure that uh, we know who we're getting in bed with, and I also want to ensure that the investor knows who they're about to get in bed with, because we're about to be sharing that same bed for quite some time. <laughs> I completely understand. I completely understand. So. I understand it's allowed you guys to scale, but what has been the biggest impact uh, for passive investors because of your service you provide? Yeah, I'd like to say that we provide, you know, um, a high returns, but I don't think that's unique. You know, there's others out there that provide, you know, sufficient returns. But I think the one thing that, uh, one of the big things that separates us apart is, you know, I've kind of carried it over from uh, the years when we were hot and heavy in single family and small multifamily property. So we, we, we utilized a lot of the same direct to owner marketing tactics that worked really well for us back then. And we, you know, we are some of the first ones to transition that over into this space, into the commercial space. And so what that means is number one, we have a proprietary database that's taken us years to build. Uh, you can't just go buy a list of mobile home parks uh, from a, you know, a list source or, or a similar site like that. It's, it's not, it's, it's just a very unique list for many different reasons. I won't go into the details, but so we've had a team of VAs in the Philippines for the past five years building out this database for us. It's very time consuming and labor intensive and just, you know, much of a manual nature to go through and, and dig out the details of each one of these properties. But, and so most of the deals, uh, pretty much 90% of the deals that we own in our portfolio today have been direct owner off market, meaning that we haven't gotten to bidding wars with other buyers. They haven't gone to a broker out to the main marketplace. And so we've been able to buy with a significant um, level or margin of safety, meaning that typically much lower price point than what it would be if it ultimately went out to the mainstream marketplace. And so for that reason, everyone benefits from that. We benefit from that. Our investors directly benefit from us being able to buy things for a substantial discount to their current intrinsic value. So um, I don't know if that's uh, you know, in, in line with what you're looking for as far as an answer, but I, I see that as a huge benefit because we're obviously buying with a huge margin of safety and with higher returns and also uh, higher future potential profits as well. Yeah, I like, I like that because you built out your system and your processes and mm-hmm. you streamlined exactly where you can find deals and put investors in them. Um, yeah, I mean, most folks in our space typically, and there's nothing wrong with this. I mean, it's the, the common way to go. I'm not going to say most folks, the, the common route to go, whether it be multifamily or mobile home parks or other, any other type of commercial real estate is by just relying on brokers, right? Brokers are the boots in the ground. They're the ones that are the market experts. They know, they should know if they're good at the, what they do. They, they should know every different owner in their respective marketplace or their farm area. They should know 
who that owner is, what their, you know, their, their, their ownership plans uh, are as far as are they, are they going to pass this down to the children? Uh, do they have an estate plan kind of mapped out or they've got a three to five year horizon? You know, they should know that. And so it's very, you know, it's, um, it's a much easier approach. A lot of times to go with brokers and just kind of build that relationship. And we do, we do both. However, we, we don't like to put all of our eggs in one basket. And uh, we like to, again, not to cut the brokers out because we've got a lot of friends that are brokers. I've bought deals through brokers, but um, I like to kind of create our own destiny, you know, and, and ensure that if there's an opportunity or deal to be had, I want to be the first to get at it. I don't want it to go to 10 other people that will ultimately bid up the price before, you know, we have the chance of winning it. Because what I've found, John, is that there's always somebody, always somebody that's willing to pay more than you for any respective deal. Always. Amen. That is right. That is true. <laughs> uh, what is the, what is something you've learned from working with passive investors? That, that, that's a great question. Um, How about this? What yeah. is something that you had to implement really fast because you started taking on passive investors? Yeah, no, that, that, that's, that's actually probably a better form question. I have an easier time answering. So, you know, uh, initially uh, we started out with a few investors and it's it slowly, you know, kept ticking up. So we have a fund model. And so we're typically raising much more capital than that of a specific deal. And so very quickly we realized that, you know, just using a you know, standard Excel model to, 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 you know, to, to really store investor information, you know, and then use like a MailChimp to email communications like that wasn't efficient at all. Um, it was clunky. And so very quickly, we, you know, we uh, dropped the investment to actually invest in, we use IMS, which is a investor portal system, you know, very expensive startup costs, especially when you're, when you're small. Um, it was very hard not to crack and it was, a, it was a painful day to make that decision. However, it was a game changer because we were just trying to be proactive. It allowed us to much more efficiently, number one, manage the process for the investor when they're coming into the funnel, you know, when they're actually coming into our investment and getting set up. It also allowed us to streamline the ongoing communications with them. Um, those that don't use a uh, investor portal such as that will find themselves uh, number one, not being able to provide top-notch support to their investors. Uh, the process for the investors is going to be very clunky, getting signed up and getting set up with all the, you know, the paperwork and documents that need to be done ahead of time. And uh, the last thing you want to do is start off that relationship on a, on a bad foot, right? I mean, just making the, the investors jump through hoops to invest with you is not the way to go, right? You got to make it as easy and streamlined as possible for them. And, I, and even IMS has got its issues, right? It could, be, it, could, it could even be more streamlined than what it is. However, there's only a certain number of options out in the marketplace. And so back then we chose what we felt was best in class. Now there's probably a few other uh, better, you know, uh, portals out there, but IMS was best in class a couple years back and um, we uh, pulled the trigger and, and put that into uh, effect right away. I completely agree. You hit on something earlier when you, when you, when you mentioned how people were coming to you, they were basically business owners and they mm -hmm. didn't have time for it and they don't have time for the, for the clunky that's it. They're busy. Yeah, absolutely. If they've done, they done well in their life, more than likely they're, they're probably pretty busy folks or they'd be rather spending their time with their family or at the job somewhere else and not, you know, jumping through hoops and, and banging their head against the wall to give someone else money, right? It, it should be fairly seamless and easy for them to hand over their money. Streamline that process. Kevin, one piece of advice for PI listeners. Yeah. So as, as far as passive investors. Absolutely. That, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, as I had, had mentioned, it, this is very much a marriage. And so, um, you know, what I'd say is this would be more to, you know, the, uh, some of the newer uh, passive investors out there that are, you know, maybe got a few, you know, a few, few investments in a few different syndications or, or funds, what have you, but they're still very new. And the vetting side is incredibly important. I mean, just like typically, and, and this is no offense to someone that maybe met a girl, love at first sight and got married and, you know, 20 years later, you're still married, right? Typically, it doesn't work that way, right? Where you meet someone, you spend a week with them, and then you get married and, you know, everything clicks, right? You start learning things about that individual that you could have probably learned if you'd have taken a little bit of time, right? You know, dated a little, couple more months or a couple years or what have you, make it through that honeymoon stage. You start learning these weird habits that they might have or things that, you know, kind of skeletons in the closet. The same thing goes with passive investors vetting sponsors, right? Take your time, right? Don't be in a rush to invest with somebody and, and know that, uh, again, as I had mentioned before, it's very easy. Good marketing is a learned skill, right? Like you can, you can learn to be a great marketer. And I, and I see a lot of things out there that are nothing more than great marketers with beautiful pitch decks 
and you know, uh, you know, promoting huge IRRs, what have you. But if you don't know how to dissect that, that offering, you know, the OM as a passive investor, then you really, you're basically buying into the marketing. You're not buying into the sponsor itself. And so spend the time to educate yourself on, you know, how are they, how are they arriving at that projected IRR, right? What, what is the actual model of this particular deal or this fund? And also what's the track record of that, of that sponsor? What have they done before this? Have they lost money? Okay. Why, why'd they lose it? And what they do to, you know, get back on, you know, get back up on the horse, what have you. And so again, just understand that track record and that history and, and understand what the skeletons in the closet are. Everyone's got a skeleton, right? I mean, of some sort, everyone's got skeletons, but you know, the important thing to do is understand what they are, but also have a discussion about them. Find out what those, how the skeletons arrived and ultimately what that individual did to keep them locked away in the closet and, and not have them affect their, you know, their, their future or their business, you know, years down the road. And so anyway, vetting is, uh, I see it, I see it get passed over a million times. Uh, you got podcasts like yours and mine, and um, there's a million others now that are in the real estate space. Everyone's out there raising capital. Everyone's an expert. They've done one deal. They're an expert. Take your time vet them, right? It's your hard-earned money. You only get to make it once, right? And hopefully you put it with someone that can help you compound it. <laughs> That's it. I love that. I love that. Kevin, before we let you go, how can we stay in touch with you? Yeah, the best way to find me is uh, through my, my personal website, kevinbupp.com. Um, you can find links to our company website and my podcast and things of that nature there. And if you want to check out what we're doing directly, you can go to sunrisecapitalinvestors.com. That's our investment website. And then as, as you'd mentioned, John, I've, I'm a host of two different podcasts. I've got one called Real Estate Investing for Cashflow, which is a commercial investment podcast. And then also the Mobile Home Park Investing Podcast. And they can both be found on iTunes and Stitcher Radio and you know, many other other uh, different mediums out there. Kevin, thank you for coming on. It, it means the world for me, to me and the, and the listeners that you came on. I really appreciate you uh, coming on the show and just sharing your experience and, and, and basically your experience with passive investors. I really appreciate yeah. that. No, thanks for having me, John. It's been a lot of fun. And I appreciate all that you do. I appreciate that. Thank you. PI listeners, thank you for listening. As always, we hope this is the best resource for your investment strategy, but also the best use of your time. As much as it pains me to leave you, but you know what time it is. It's time to go put this into practice. Till next time, till we meet again. PI listeners, I'm grateful for your time and I appreciate you for listening. For more episodes like this, either subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast platform or go to PassiveInvestorShow.com. While you're there, please check out the blogs that provide breakdowns of real estate industry terms that will help you understand the lingo in future episodes. Can I ask you to do me one favor? If you resonate with any of this and it helps you become a better real estate passive investor, please let me know by leaving a review on iTunes or your preferred podcast platform. The more we know, the more we grow. Thank you for tuning in. Happy investing.